I'd like to go to Romans this morning, please. There flashed across my mind while Tim Bishop was giving that word of prophecy. Just a beautiful, beautiful picture of all of our people in the household of God being in the throne room of God, having a visit with Jesus Christ. And that's what I think occurs when we get to the greatness of that word. That word is just visiting in the throne room of God, visiting with Jesus Christ and what he accomplished. And just coming to the realization and the absolute commitment of our knowledgeable position and understanding that we are what the word of God says we are and that we have what the word of God says we have. Romans chapter 8 is a real heavy. It says in verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. For you have not received a bondage spirit, just think of it this morning like being in the throne room of God. This whole building here like the throne room of God. I know it's a very low picture, but picture it as big as you can. If you like lilies in a corner, put them in there, roses. If you like overstuffed chairs or understuffed, do as you like. If you like three inch thick carpets, put them in, I don't care. But the throne room of God and visiting with his son, Jesus Christ. And he says to you, you've not received a bondage spirit. So that you should fear. You have received a sonship spirit. And by that sonship spirit, we cry, Father, Father, which means we speak to him by that sonship spirit, S-I-T. That's how you cry, Abba, Father. And that spirit, the spirit itself, bears witness with the Spirit, our Spirit, the Spirit. The Spirit bears witness in that crying of the Abba Father. The Spirit bears witness with the Spirit that's in you, which is our Spirit. And the witness that it bears is that we are what? Children, children of what? Lordy Pete, if we're children of God, then we're what? Children then why do we want to say any less than that? Why do we want to manifest any less? You know, you can say it with your mind, with a mental assent, and still not really believe it in the inner fibers of your being. That it just oozes out of your whole self that you're a child of God. That thing alone would change the whole country if we could get people to believe it. I'm thinking now if even any church people started thinking about it. Well, that'd be the last miracle that could happen, maybe. <laughs> um, to think that they're children of what? Amen. That gives us a big daddy. The biggest. And if your father was the most important father in the entire world, you'd most likely blow the buttons off of your shoes or something in your walk. 
You'd be so, you know, you'd most likely be such a damn egotist nobody else could talk to you. <laughs> but how few people ever see the greatness of being a child of God and blow the buttons off of it, being egotistical for God. Why not? I don't know anything better. He's the greatest. Look, it says we're children of God. It either tells the truth or what? If it lies, we just should quit. But if it tells the truth, then we ought to just tell it like it is. And tell it hard, tell it fast, repeat it, drive it, drive it, drive it. Children of what? That's quite a visit. <laughs> you walk in and say, hi, kid, how are you? You know, God talking to you. <laughs> See, how are things going for you today? Need an ice cream cone? Good. Buy the whole damn place. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> yeah. Boy, oh, boy. See? He said, we don't have a bondage spirit to fear. Everything the world is doing today is put fear in people. There are only two ways you can live, either by fear or by love. Fear is that negative side, and that's the possession side many times. They'll drive. Love is by freedom of the will. Love has more power than fear, but the problem is the mind. That's the whole lousy problem. Because that love principle has to be renewed mind and you've got to be just as hard up here with the love as they are hard on the fear. That's where, the only way love will ever win. Fear is always frustrating, always defeating, always emaciating, always pulling you down. And that's all the world does. That's right. It's all it ever does. We got any coffee in this world? If they don't have coffee in the next, I'm coming back. <laughs> Shoot. You know, I, I was so deeply engrossed in the Word this morning, I didn't know it was... 10.15, oh, Craig ran over to see if we were going to wait for the kingdom to come or what we were going to do. <laughs> and I was just trying to gel in my heart, you know, some stuff that's gone on. Every time I read the paper, watch the news, read almost anything, I become negative. When I read God's word, I'm positive. Now, I got to be stupid to continue to spend my time on those things that make me negative. Suppose we lose the whole world, everything else is gone, and I stay positive. We've only lost the world, that's all. <laughs> I just didn't know we were going to lose it until it happened, and I was positive about the thing, so I go into the negative situation very positive. <laughs> So what? But if I continue reading and filling my mind and listening to everything the world has to offer, I haven't got enough time and a mind to absorb the <coughs> positive side. I know they laugh at us. They say, well, you can't keep up with the times unless you read Newsweek. Oh, hell. Take a look at this week's Newsweek. No, don't. Because <laughs> the news this week is all negative. Not one page says to me that I haven't got a spirit of bondage in Newsweek. That's right. <laughs> Not one place in Newsweek this week do they tell me that I have a sonship spirit and that God is my father. That's right. The word tells me this. This makes me happy. 
This makes me joyful. This turns me on. That other thing makes me negative. Makes me feel, well, what's the use of it all? You know, the whole damn thing's down the drain anyways. What's the use? When you get to that place that you say to yourself, what's the use? You've gotten off of the word and onto the world. Because for those of us who know God's word, we know the use. What's the use? That we may be shining lights, the word says. That we may be the salt of the earth. Oh, shoot, I can think of right now, but there are dozens of others we can be. The word, the word. Then you know what else it says? Boy, not only children of God, but we're heirs of or with God. And a joint heir with Christ. <clears throat> Whew. My little old stupid mind can't fathom it. I just believe it. And that makes you queer, freaky. <laughs> that makes you, you know, a square peg in a round hole. <laughs> This makes you nuts, as far as the world is concerned. You go out and you say that you are an heir of God and that you're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the psychiatrist will be looking for you. <laughs> because everything's so screwed up, for them truth is heir. That's how far they've gone off, and that is, they're just so screwed up. Well, look, the word says, we're joint heirs with Christ, we're heirs of God. <sighs> we suffered with him. Therefore, we're also what? Glorified together. And for I reckon that the negatives of this present time are not worthy. And all the negatives cause nothing but suffering. But if it communicates to you, just put the negatives in there instead of suffering. Because that's what negatives bring. Of this present time are not worthy. They're not worthy. Well, if they're not worthy, why should I spend my time on them? <laughs> they're not worthy for even me... Take a look at. They say you have to read Newsweek to stay up with the times. Well, we already know the times because the word tells us the world time. That it's always defeating, frustrating, negative, the kingdoms of the world, adversary. All of that's told us in the word. So if we know the word, we're always ahead of time. Not worthy. When you look at the glory which shall be revealed to us. Boy, oh boy. And then you finally have to get down to, I don't know, 28. All things work together for what? Yeah. Right. <laughs> but it's conditional. Upon what? <clears throat> to them who love God. And love is not just a mental ascent. It's a heartfelt reality. It's an active, walking, believing You say, if I say, if I say to him, well, I love him, and then I'm always talking about him, that's a bunch of baloney. All things only work for, together for good to those that really love God. And to love is to walk, to manifest, to indicate this. Well, well. 31 says, what shall we then say to these things? And as 
far as I'm concerned, all the negative things of the world. If God be for us, who can what? Yes. Right. Somebody said it last <coughs> night. Oh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, guys. They said, our God's able to deliver, but if not, if not, if not, if not, we're still not going to bow down and serve them. We will die before we bow. If God be for us, who can be what? Yes. Even if we die, God would still be for us. For we will not bow to their unbelief and their God rejection and all of the rest of the baloney that they're trying to feed. In that great 33rd verse, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Who's going to lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is as scratched in the text. The text reads, Shall God, who justified, question? Who's going to lay any charge? You know, charge of condemnation, charge of this, charge of that, on God's elect. Shall God, who justified that man? It seems to me, by sheer logic, if God justified you, then he would be the only one who could put any charges against you. Not man. Only God. And we have to be what the Word of God says we have to be. If God's not going to lay any charge against his elect, then what right do I have to lay it against you? Because it has to be sin on my part when I do it. Because I just read that I'm a joint heir with Christ. I'm an heir of God. Now if I, as God's son... Do the opposite of that. That has to be sin, baby. We got to get lined up a little bit once in a while on what sin is. <laughs> Boy. If God isn't going to charge his elect, and I'm a son of God, and a joint heir with Christ, and I lay it on you, then I am better than what God is. Now, that's an impossibility. Who is he that condemneth? It is as scratched again. The text read, Shall Christ who died? Question. See, the chapter begins with, there is therefore now no what? Sure. Here it is in 34. Who is he that condemneth? Christ died to get us out of condemnation, so there's therefore now no condemnation. And if Christ died... And if God raised him, who is even at the right hand of God, and he maketh intercession for us, then who is going to lay any condemnation upon God's elect? I know I'm still just mouthing words to most of our people across the country. But kids, it's got to get to the place that it gets out of your stupid mouth, into your heart, and walk on it. I have taught the core my heart. And even they walk over it at times. I don't blame them. They have to grow too. But boy, I keep telling our people, there are things that you put in your lockbox, you turn the key and you throw the key away. That's what he's talking about.
Boy, oh boy. <laughs> boy, Christ died, yes, but he's risen again, and he's even at the right hand of God. Do you get that? Even at the right hand of God? That puts the emphasis in a fantastic way. Why, why, why are you saying, look, kids, even Christ is at the right hand of God. He's not sitting down at his feet. He's way up at his hands, <laughs> you know. He's not, you know, he's not just out there tripping out on this and that. He's right next to the top man, top boss man. Got the picture? Even Christ, yeah, even Christ. Who is risen is at the right hand of God. Even he's there for us. He's not only risen. That'd be fantastic. Just imagine he walking in here right now in his resurrected body. He did this a few times, you know. Pulled those things after he got up. Remember? Gospels. Boy, that must have been electrifying. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> Imagine old Peter jumping out of the boat when he said, well, fellas, come on over. we got plenty of fish to eat over here. <laughs> toast made, and the grape is there to put on the toast, the butter. And... But it's better than that. Better than that. At the right hand of God. The right hand. Even at the right hand who also makes intercession for us. Boy, the beauty of that is fantastic. Then, of course, it closes with the greatness of this. Boy, when you get that far, then you've got to get to verse 35 without that. There, you know, it also makes intercession for us. He takes us to God what God is to us, who we are, what Christ is, who Christ is in us, what we are in him. And then he says, okay, with all that, who's going to separate us? Who's going to separate us from the love of God? Love of Christ. Who? Yeah, who? You want to fight with God? Go ahead. See? If God's my father, then if you're going to attack me, and God's my, my father. What's my God going to do to you? He'll suck you right in the eyeball. In the kisser. He'll hit you. He's my warrior. He's my... Bears his arm for me. Somebody said that last night. See? Our God is our shield and our buckler. Therefore, who's going to separate us from the love of Christ? Well, shall a little tribulation? A few distresses? A little bit of persecution? A little bit of famine? Maybe less than 14 dresses? Nakedness? <laughs> Peril or what? Or... As it is written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long, we're counted as sheep for the slaughter. That's the way it's written. But verse 37 says, no, sir, nay. And that isn't a mule. <laughs> this is the one that's just as stubborn as that West Virginia mule who's neighing. And he says, no, no. No. And you know what no means? No. In all these things, we are more than, and the word is super conquerors. Because even in death, you could be a super conqueror. Because you still will not bow. 
you still will not sell out on the principles of the truth of God's word and that would still be fantastic. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we may die, we may burn, O oh king, but we will not, what? To serve your gods or your God. Verse 38 says just what I told you. For I am persuaded. If you're persuaded, you've come to that place that there's not one shadow of doubt in your mind, else you're not persuaded. To be persuaded is to know that you know that you know that you know that you know. Abraham got there at 99. Some of us got to make it a lot earlier than that. I am persuaded that neither what? Yes. Nor life. Boy, that's two extremes. Nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present right now, anything that's present or anything to come, no matter how high or how low, nor any other creature or anything in God's creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our what? Lord. It's a walk of glory all the way. Even if we died death or what? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. And if nothing can separate us from the love of God, then nothing can separate us. Really fantastic, isn't it? For I'm persuaded. Persuaded. Well, are you? See, that's it. God promised he'd meet our need. So the thing we continue to do is to so live that we don't have many needs. Discipline your life that you can do with less. We try this in the core. That's why we give them $20 a month. And then, they, you know, first they learn to cheat a little bit. And sometimes they learn to cheat for the all year of the year. Uh... We don't teach the cheating. What we're trying to do is to teach them to learn to live on essentials, need. The something. See, if you're paying $400 a month rent, someplace along the line, Somebody's going to have to find $400 for you. But if you could, if your mind could take it for the glory of the word and the outreach of the word, and you could live in a $100 location, then you, $300 you don't have to be concerned about. You don't need it. So you try to bring your life down to the least common denominator in need. I think when we think in terms of more than abundant life, super conquers, we're, we're, we're thinking in terms of increasing our need. That's right. Formerly we made $100 a week, now we're more than conquers, now we want $250 a week. You see the principle? I think the more abundant life has to be seen in the light of which I'm sharing with you this morning. Bringing your need down. Getting it out of the greed category. Bringing it down. Now, I'm not speaking of poverty. 
That wouldn't be right. But don't worry so much about poverty because we haven't even come down to that need level, let alone poverty. But we're, we're, we're thinking way up here on what we'd like to have and then we think everything en route must be poverty. Do you know if you have good health, sound mind, food, clothing, shelter, we're rich. Even without a telephone, we would be. <laughs> See, wouldn't we now? See, it's only when all of those things are, are begun to be subtracted from life, then you realize how wealthy you were spiritually. <clears throat> I'll bet you if any of us lost our arm today, we would be very appreciative to have it back. Then we would realize what a tremendous thing an arm is. It's like your thumb. You never know how beautiful the thumb is until you got a sore one. And then you're hitting it all the time or any other, right? You never just realized how beautiful your fingers were until one gets sore and then you keep bumping it all the time and you become cognizant of that finger. We just take so many things for granted. Well, what else you want to share? That's all I know about it. <laughs> That's enough. That's enough. <laughs> Yeah. You see how beautiful the word relates to people and how it electrifies, how it blesses. It makes you feel like you want to live. It makes you feel like you want to bless people. It makes you feel like you want to help somebody. The other side always makes you feel like you want to quit living and beat the hell out of everybody. <laughs> Take away, right? Isn't the word just beautiful, what it does? <clears throat> and we just got to get to the place that we absolutely have nothing to hold forth to people except the word. See? You know, I thought about this a while back. Somebody wanted to, said, well, they'd like to buy so-and-so and they'd like to have, borrow a hundred dollars. I said, hell, don't buy it. What do you want to borrow for to buy? Believe, you know, you got to believe God after you get it anyways to pay off what you borrowed, right? Why not just wait a little longer and believe God now and do some planning? Then buy it. Everybody wants to plan afterwards. <laughs> hey, why not plan before? I think most people think, well, when the need's there tomorrow morning, then all I have to do is say, well, Lord, pour it in here, uh, and I'll take care of it. it. The principles of God do not work that way. Even on Thursday. <laughs> well, anybody else want to share anything? We got two minutes. <laughs> well, it's wonderful having you this morning and enjoy the day. Bless one another and be blessed and just hang in there. Father, I thank you for the day together, the morning here especially, to open up this wonderful Sunday again with our people. Thank you for the word that lives among us and the greatness of your love for us. And I thank you, Father, for blessing our people so abundantly this day through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. God bless all of you.